So 160 years ago, Karl Marx basically predicted capitalism's demise as it's unfolding right now. He predicted it. <laughs> he said that capitalism would basically eat itself. Um, and some people say, well, you know, he, you know, the communism didn't really work. Well, the Soviet commun wasn't, wasn't communism. It was, it was, uh, it became about p powerful people abusing their power as is, as is usually the case. But I want to go into what Marx said. Um, there was, he talked about automation. He talked about how machines were going to replace the worker. He also predicted globalization and the rising inequality of today, uh, which is pretty, pretty amazing. So, um, Carol Gold, who's a philosophy professor at Hunter College in the University of Mork, uh, New York, um, but said several things. Marx predicted that for a communist revolution to survive, it would need to involve the countries with the most developed industries and become at least as broadly international as the capitalist system it would replace. So here's what else that Gould said. He was correct that the gap between labor and capital would get worse. She says, Marx predicted that capitalism would lead to poverty in the midst of plenty. Hmm. Sound familiar in America? A scenario that's depressingly familiar today. Uh, the U United States Department of Housing and Urban Development estimates there are roughly half a million homeless people in the U.S. on any given night in a country that is estimated to have roughly 18 million empty homes in it. Eighteen million empty homes, half a million homeless people. We could give them each one their own home and still have seventeen point five million homes. Does that seem right? Meanwhile, Harvard Business Review points out. Contemporary society is characterized by a sense of alienation among workers, distance from the output of their labor, and the fetishization of commodities, both predicted by Marx. The revolution described by Marx could one day transpire, though not soon. Among many necessary factors, working class people in the most economically developed nations would need to develop greater political independence from the capitalist classes in these countries. We would also need to see the emergence of a more principled anti-imperialist politics that oppose war and racism and promote solidarity among working people of all nations. Oh, that's what we keep talking about on this show. Uniting working people of all nations. People who all want to end wars and inequality and racism. So much of racism and misogyny are fueled by capitalism. I'm not discounting the, the people who have the crazy ideas, you know, whatever, oh, the, the races aren't, you know, whatever, this race is better than that race or whatever, sure. But that is way more um, enhanced or supported or even can flourish that type of racism and sexism can flourish way more under this um, unregulated capitalism that just pits us against each other. That just chews up labor and spits it out. Chews it up and spits it out. That was the other thing too. The labor movements in the 30s were very diverse. They were very inclusive. And people went, whoa, whoa, whoa. We can't have all these different ethnicities working together to get better labor rights. We better divide them up. Oh, the birth of the Klan.
But there is little indication of what would be necessary to bring about such radical political changes. Former British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher used the phrase, there is no alternative to explain the commitment to the capitalist system. Thanks, Maggie. Thoroughly understanding capitalism informed by Marx's piercing analysis allows us to envision potential alternatives. If you don't understand that capitalism itself is, what capitalism itself is, then how can you hope to formulate any revisionist system and critique of what might lie beyond it? Because we're told capitalism is the best system. It's, it, 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 the market will correct itself. But one of the things Marx also predicted was that recessions and economic upheaval, that's not by mistake, that's built into capitalism. It need, capitalism needs to do that so that the wealthy can stay wealthy, which is pretty amazing. Every major historical advance in technology has destroyed human jobs, with some leaving many unemployed for long periods at a time. The human workforce has responded to these sh shift by gradually adjusting, taking on the new jobs generated by these advances. And so capitalism has continued to function, always depending on both human labor and technology. The current crisis posed by automation may not be resolved as easily as the past, though. The situation is very different and depends adequately and demands, excuse me, demands adequately sophisticated analysis about the nature of capitalism. That's what makes Das Kapital a work of theory and critique that's not limited to the 19th century. The capitalist system, after all, is the world we continue to live in today. It's an interesting read And they predicted it. He looked at capitalism 160 years ago. I had no idea about the internet and took no clue that any of these types of technology, <laughs> cell phone, not even close, man. I mean, this is like, we're talking about the light bulb hadn't been invented 160 years ago. The light bulb had not been invented and he was predicting robots were gonna take over for humans. <laughs> So, um, still very relevant and Quartz Media, I'm going to do some more stories from them. Thanks for watching the show, you guys. Like and subscribe. I got tour dates at GrahamElwood.com below. Uh, May this week, going to Tempe, Lake Havasu, Vegas, and San Diego if you live in those areas. It's progressive comedy. I'm going to be interviewing people for this show after those live shows. So if you're in the audience, I'll do some interviews with you. And June 20th in Nashville, August 9th, doing Political Vigilante live in Seattle. So a lot of opportunities to come out live. I'd love to meet all of you uh, in person. Thanks for supporting the show.